We're gonna start this video with the quiz. Go ahead and put your answers in the comments. One of these lichens is wolf lichen, which is a toxic lichen, and one of these lichens is usnea, which is a commonly used medicinal lichen. So go ahead and put the letters first of the toxic one and then of usnea in the comments. You can pause the video for a second if you need some time. All right, answers incoming. A is wolf lichen and D is usnea. To learn about the other two lichens and how to tell all of these lichens apart, go ahead and keep watching. I decided to make this video because the other day I was on Facebook and somebody had posted a picture of wolf lichen, which is toxic, saying like, hey, I harvested some usnea. Does anybody know where I can get more? And obviously that's a really terrible mistake to make because wolf lichen's toxic and you wouldn't want to get hurt. So of course I commented with as much information as I could give about identifying usnea correctly and where to find it. Uh, but I thought it would be a great idea to make a video about this so that other people can learn about this when they're harvesting lichens and how not to make mistakes. So Clint, if you're watching, this one's for you. So I want to do a quick background on lichens because I think it can help us understand how to ID them a little bit. Lichens are not mosses. They are also not strictly fungi. They are actually a symbiotic relationship between two or three or more organisms, always a fungi, and then either a cyanobacteria or an algae, and sometimes both. And the algae grows on the fungus, the fungus provides structure, and the algae or cyanobacteria can photosynthesize and create sugars for the fungus to feed on. And lichens usually grow on trees, um, and they don't actually usually get nutrients from the tree itself or they grow on rocks. They're not getting nutrient from the rocks. They're getting nutrients from the sun and the air and the rain. So lichen plays a really important role in forest nutrient cycling because it actually fixes, fixes nitrogen from the air. And then when it falls onto the forest floor and rots, it puts nitrogen into the soil. And Pacific Northwest forests are particularly nitrogen poor, so this is a really important part of forest ecology. So when we're harvesting lichens, it's important to consider that, and it's also important to consider how slowly a lot of lichens grow. Many crustose lichens that grow on rocks, literally called crustose because they're kind of crusty on the rock, um, those lichens can grow as little as one millimeter, and I think even sometimes even less than that every year. And so sometimes those big lichen patches you see on rocks that may be like black or orange or green, those can be like 100 years old, which is so wild. So it's really important when we're harvesting lichens in the wild, like usnea, to not harvest too much and to not avoid harvesting a sensitive species of lichen. Luckily, usnea is actually pretty common in the Pacific Northwest on a lot of different types of trees, including red alder. So most species of usnea, we don't really need to worry about sustainability too much. We just want to make sure we're not harvesting like bags and bags of it. In case you're wondering at this point in the video, why the heck we're even making a video about usnea, it's because usnea is one of the few commonly used medicinal lichens in North America. Usnea is actually the genus name of a group of species of lichens. And most people refer to those lichens as old man's beard. People mostly use usnea as an antimicrobial and also an immune stimulant, so they use it to fight infections and for colds and flus. There's a lot more information about the medicinal uses of usnea in my book, and there's also directions on how to make an usnea double extract on page 225 if you are curious. If you don't have my book yet, I'll go ahead and put a link in the description. Let's get into the lookalikes. I have selected four lichens to compare to usnea, which I find are the most commonly mistaken for usnea. But keep in mind that there are a couple other lichens that look like usnea. A lot of those lichens grow on the ground, which is something that you should know about all the lichens we're talking about in this video. These are all lichens that grow on trees, not on rocks, and not on the ground. You might be curious why you wouldn't want to harvest some of these other lichens. Wolf lichen, as I mentioned earlier in the video, is toxic, so you obviously wouldn't want to be consuming that on accident. The other lichens are not necessarily toxic, but they, can, they contain a lot more usnic acid, which Usnea does contain in a smaller amount, and it is a GI irritant. So one of the main risks is A, it wouldn't have the medicinal action that you were looking for, and B, might irritate your guts basically and make you have an unpleasant time. Let's start with Usnea. Usnea has a couple of traits to look out for, but the number one trait that is going to help you identify Usnea is by doing the tendon test. Usnea has a strong inner tendon covered by an outer sheath. And the other lichens, when pulled apart like this, 
will not have that inner tendon exposed. The inner tendon of Ustia is rubbery and bouncy, so you can kind of pull it back and forth a little bit. The other lichens will just break. So that is the number one test to see if you have Ustia. However, we also want to look closely at the intersections of the branches on Ustia. You will notice that Ustia has rounded branches, so if you were to take a cross section, it would be a circle. And where they meet, it's much like pipes, right? It's just one pipe going into another pipe with no flattening. As we'll see in a little bit, other species of lichen have a lot more flattening than Usnia. Something else that I'm gonna mention about Usnia is its habitat. It doesn't like dry climates as much as these other lichens can, and it does prefer certain types of trees. So alder trees and apple trees and other deciduous trees tend to be its preference, but Ustnia longissima, for example, does grow in Douglas fir trees. So kind of a tough one as far as the habitat, just because lichens can be a little bit non-selective about the trees that it grows on. All right, now let's get into wolf lichen, which belongs to the genus Lotharia. Lotharia vulpina is the most commonly known one, but there are actually two others that grow in our region, and they look pretty much the same. All of these lichens are going to have this kind of like Mountain Dew-like color is the best way I can say it. It's like a yellow-green. Some of them have reproductive structures, cup-like reproductive structures that look like this. That's two of the species, which is actually not Lotharia vulpina, by the way. And these lichens prefer the drier parts of our region. So where I live, which is on the eastern slope of the Cascades, it's a little bit drier and we have a lot of ponderosa trees and we have a lot of wolf lichen. That said, it also does grow on Douglas fir trunks at times. So last note about wolf lichen is that it is actually harvested for the floral industry commercially, which means that it already is kind of in a state of over harvest. I wouldn't call it threatened, but um, it is something that we don't wanna harvest a bunch of in the wild and maybe just not harvesting at all. Um, if you're wondering why I'm talking about harvesting wolf lichen, it is used as a natural dye agent, and I think some people even use it for incense, um, and obviously like decoration in general. So, I mean, every time I think about this floral industry commercial harvest thing, I always like, it makes me question the, the origins of all these things that we're buying in craft stores or at the flower store or in our terrariums, and it just challenges me to be a better consumer. Okay, let's talk about maybe the closest look-alike to Usnia, something that literally I've seen trained herbalists harvest on accident, and that is a genus of lichens called Alectoria. And there are actually a few other genuses that have like almost similar ones like this, like Brioria, um, but none of these will pass the tendon test. However, if Usnia is dry, sometimes it will break. So. Sometimes the tendon test is kind of hard, so we kind of do need to have a couple other things. So what I'm going to point out about Alectoria in general, and we're looking in this video at Alectoria sormentosa, which is really common where I live. It grows on the trunks of fir trees. It likes a slightly higher, higher elevation, though not always. And it kind of grows in these really long things off of the trunks. Um, and what we're looking at is the deltas where the branches fork and those are flattened, whereas on Usnia, those branches are never flattened, just like the pipes in your house, like I mentioned before. All right, the last species that we're looking at is Avernia. And Avernia is a tough one because it literally likes to grow right next to Usnia and sometimes literally like up all tangled in it. So this is one where you might just harvest it because it's growing right next to it and the color is almost the same. However, if you look more closely, you will notice that the Avernia has flattened leaf structures and Usnia is always, always gonna be the wire-shaped leaf structures. If you enjoyed the nerdiness of this video, you might enjoy the book that I referenced for it, which is Macro Lichens of the Pacific Northwest. If you are a naturalist or a plant nerd in general, this is definitely a must have for your like local guidebook collection. I'm Natalie and I make videos about foraging, herbalism, and wild foods, so go ahead and subscribe if you'd like to see more.